Elisa Silva Samudio was born on February 22, 1985, near the Brazilian capital. Her father, Luis Carlos Samudio, was an architect, and her mother, Sonia Fatima Moura, worked on a farm. Luis Carlos and Fatima's life together did not last long. They were both unhappily married and divorced when Elisa was only six months old. Luis Carlos was very cruel to his wife and promiscuous. The woman was near death several times. He did not want his daughter to stay with his wife after the divorce, so he said he would not give her the girl alive. Fatima had to leave her home without her daughter. She started a small farm and met a man who later gave her a son. Now Fatima rarely saw her daughter. When Elisa was 10 years old, Fatima had the courage to take the girl without Luis Carlos's consent. She quickly found a common language with her younger brother, stepfather, and mother. We all lived a peaceful and happy life, but it lasted only a year. Luis Carlos came for the girl and forced her to return to him under threat of death. Elisa did not want to stay with her father, who was very cruel to her. When Elisa became a teenager, he ordered her to entertain his friends in exchange for small amounts of money, so when the girl turned 18, she decided to move from her father to Sao Paulo. Her main dream was to become a model and marry a soccer player. Since childhood, she loved the sport and dreamed of having a family with a professional player. She arrived in Sao Paulo with little money and not knowing anyone. Elisa decided to find a job as a model and build a successful career, but unfortunately, not everything went according to plan. The girl couldn't get hired anywhere. She started selling herself to survive and get some money. It is also known that Elisa appeared in several adult movies while trying to find work as a model. Her pictures even appeared in Brazilian magazines. Thanks to her modeling career and connections, the girl attended soccer events. There she managed to meet famous football players. One of them was Bruno Fernandes de Sousa, born in 1984 in Belo Horizonte, Brazil. He was a goalkeeper in one of the most popular Brazilian teams. The exact date of their acquaintance is unknown. Bruno was never able to name the place and time. General acquaintances said that they met in 2008 at a barbecue, and once the footballer confirmed this version and then changed it, saying that they met at a party for adults, which was organized by his friend. It was definitely known that Bruno and Elisa were at the aforementioned party, and during one of the stormy nights Bruno's contraceptive broke, which later turned out to be a very important fact. Elisa became Bruno's mistress because he already had a wife. Bruno played for a very popular Brazilian flamenco team. He wasn't looking for anything serious because he was already married and didn't want to ruin his reputation. Although, according to mutual friends of Bruno and Elisa, he promised the girl that he would divorce his wife for her sake. Bruno often spent the night at Elisa's house. They spent a lot of time together, away from the press, because Bruno did not want any trouble. Their relationship lasted a few months, after which Elisa told the young man that she was pregnant. They both remembered the unfortunate night when Bruno's contraceptive broke. He took the news terribly, as Elisa was just another distraction for him. He insisted on an abortion, even bribing some people to gain the girl's confidence and force her to make the decision. But it didn't work with her. She wanted to keep the baby and be a mother. Of course, this led to endless scandals. Their relationship ended later that month. In October, Elisa also filed a police report for attempted kidnapping and harassment. The girl went public and appeared on Brazilian television screens as Bruno's secret pregnant lover, but that wasn't all she claimed. She also said that Bruno was a very violent man and that she was afraid of him. All of this was recorded in a statement to the police. The girl also said that she was afraid that Bruno might have put some abortion drugs in her food. At that time, the court did not study the case and Elisa's statement well enough. And at the end of the trial, Bruno Fernandez was banned from coming closer than 300 meters to the girl. Elisa wanted additional protection from Bruno, but the judge decided that it was not necessary because they had an unofficial relationship. The court decision did not even take into account the girl's pregnancy. Eliza began to demand financial support from Bruno for medical expenses related to her child and for healthier food, but Bruno refused to pay, saying that the child was not his, that it could have been any other man since Eliza led a dissolute lifestyle. The girl, however, assured that after meeting Bruno, she had no one else. Nevertheless, the man continued to deny his paternity. In 2010, Elisa gave birth to a boy in one of Sao Paulo's hospitals. Bruno paid for all the medical care, but he wanted nothing to do with her or the baby. He did not see him until the boy was four months old. 
Elisa wanted to give the baby his father's last name, so she suggested that Bruno make sure the child was his and take a DNA test. The man agreed. June 4, 2010, according to Elisa's lawyer, was the last time the girl spoke to her friends or family, and judging from her correspondence, Bruno agreed to acknowledge his paternity and help with money, offering the girl to move into a new apartment, which he paid for. Since Bruno's contact, the girl wanted to pick up the paternity and child support petition she had previously filed with the police. On June 5, 2010, Bruno played his last game with his team. Elisa's friends were concerned about the girl's lack of contact. Although Elisa and her mother did not have a close relationship, the woman found it strange that her daughter did not call her for so long and did not tell her about the child. The police began searching for her. The news of the girl's disappearance was quickly leaked to the press, and of course Bruno started asking questions. He said that he knew Elisa, but that he was not the father of her child, that it was just an affair. The police had no evidence linking Bruno to Elisa's disappearance, although everyone saw and assumed that the young man knew something about her disappearance. It wasn't until June 24th that a new clue emerged in the case. An anonymous caller informed the police that Elisa had been murdered, her clothes burned, and her body hidden on Bruno's property. But even after this call, the police could not get permission to search Bruno's farm or home. The judge wanted more evidence. In addition, the soccer player was a well-known figure in Brazil, and if he was innocent, the police did not want people to doubt their competence, so they were very careful not to cause a public outcry. They installed a listening device in Bruno's house. On June 26, 2010, just a few hours after the wiretap was installed, Elisa's son was found in the house. The boy was with a woman named Fernanda Castro. This was one of Bruno's next mistresses. Fernanda said that the child was given to her by Bruno's wife to keep an eye on him. The police found this very strange and decided to question Bruno and his wife, but nothing came of it. They didn't give any information, so they armed themselves with a bunch of lawyers. Fernanda was taken into custody. The police were awaiting clarification of the remaining details. On June 28, after police questioned Fernando, Bruno and his wife refused to comment. A judge authorized a search of one of Bruno's homes. Women's clothing and diapers were found in the house. They also searched Bruno's car, Bruno's Range Rover, where they found traces of blood whose DNA analysis matched Elisa's DNA samples. They also found sunglasses and black high-heeled shoes. Elisa's friends quickly identified the girl's belongings. The police had enough evidence to link Bruno to the girl's disappearance, but the judge didn't think it was enough, and the case was dropped. On July 6th of that year, another important detail emerged. The police arrested a 17-year-old teenager, Sergio. He was Bruno's cousin. Sergio told the police a very interesting story. The boy said that he had participated in the murder of Elisa, which Bruno had planned from beginning to end. Sergio was with Bruno's best friend and another man, the hitman. According to Sergio, Bruno wanted to get rid of an annoying girl who was pushing him too hard. He was afraid she would reveal more information to the press and ruin his career. Sergio described everything in great detail. According to the man, it went like this. Bruno invited Elisa over to one of his houses. They wanted to talk about money for the baby, the DNA test, and the baby's surname. Elisa didn't have a car, so the soccer player said he would send a driver for her. It was Bruno's best friend, Luis Enrique Ferreira, but his purpose was not to take her to Bruno, but to kidnap and take the girl's life, prevent the collection of child support, and ruin the soccer player's reputation. In the car were Elisa with the baby, Luis Enrique and Sergio, who was given a gun. He started to attack the girl, but she was able to knock the gun out of his hands, and he tried to shoot, but the gun was not loaded. The gun was only given to him to intimidate the girl. At this point, Sergio hit Elisa several times on the head with the gun until she lost consciousness. They then took the girl to Bruno's house where he was waiting for them. He took her belongings and burned them. Bruno told them to dispose of the girl and leave no evidence, but he did not order anything to be done to the child. After giving all the instructions, he flew to Rio de Janeiro. Sergio said that Bruno left about $2,000 for each of them for the work they had done. Bruno told Sergio and Luis Enrique to come with Elisa to another of his places where a special man was waiting for them. When they arrived with the body, they met a man named Marcus Aparecido, a former police officer who was now in the homicide business. He specialized in getting rid of corpses. Everyone who worked with him said he always did his job cleanly and no evidence was ever found after his hands. 
Elisa was taken to the station. Sergio was with the baby at the time. Marcus took a very long time to deal with the girl. He tortured her in a horrible and cruel way. It is not even known exactly how many days the girl suffered in that place until she died. There are several versions because Sergio changed his mind more than once, and some things contradict the official data about the case. According to the man, on June 8th, they forced Elisa to call her friend and tell her that she and Bruno were fine, that he had acknowledged paternity, and that he would meet all her demands. They also made her say that she was leaving the country, but none of the girl's friends received any such calls, and her lawyer said that the last time she was in contact with family or friends was June 4th, as mentioned above. One of the police versions of the story is that Bruno was with them that day and wanted to see Elisa's death in person. Sergio said that after hours of torture, the girl began to beg for her life, at which point the killer strangled her with a necktie, and then, according to the police, Sergio gave the child to Bruno, and they left. After Bruno left, the killer cut the victim's body into pieces and carried them away in a black bag. He then took the girl's flesh to the four dogs. According to Sergio, Marcus first threw the dog's hand, and after they continued to eat, he completely disposed of her body but the police also found confusion in Sergio's story. According to the boyfriend, Elisa's remains were buried on the same Bruno property where she was originally taken, but police found no bones there. The men may have agreed not to reveal the exact location of the girl's remains. After Sergio's confession, the judge approved Bruno's arrest, as well as that of all the other participants in the murder. On July 9th, the police went to Bruno's house, but the soccer player was not there. A few hours later, Bruno and his best friend drove themselves to the police station to surrender to the authorities. They did this at the behest of Bruno's lawyer. According to him, it was the best decision for his public image to turn himself in rather than be detained in his own home. Bruno reported that he was completely innocent and had nothing to do with the murder. At the time of his arrest, Bruno was still listed as a member of his soccer club until the details became clear. But as the case dragged on, his contract was terminated on July 15th. All of Brazil followed Bruno's trial. The soccer player was very famous at that time. All the details Sergio told were in the headlines of newspapers and magazines. The people of Brazil followed Bruno's case on their television screens. People wanted to know if the police would find Elisa's remains. It's not every day that a popular and famous soccer player does something so terrible. During the trial, Elisa's family fought for custody of their son. Initially, custody was given to her father because he was the last person the minor girl lived with, but Eliza's mother immediately went to court to get custody because she didn't want the boy to grow up in the same hellish conditions that Eliza lived in. The judge immediately took custody away from Luis Carlos because the man had a previous conviction for molesting a 10-year-old girl and Fatima, the boy's grandmother, became the child's legal guardian. She also requested a paternity test, which confirmed that Bruno Fernandez was the father of Eliza's son. The police had to find the girl's body to prove Bruno's guilt. They searched numerous places where the men might have hidden the girl's remains, but found nothing. A total of six men were arrested. In addition to the four men, including Bruno, his wife and the mistress who had taken care of Elisa's child, were also arrested. After several months of Marcos's trial, the hitman received 19 years for murder and three years for hiding the body. The mistress received five years for withholding information from the police and for being held with Elisa's son. The trial of Bruno and his wife took a little longer because he filed many appeals and denied any involvement in the case. His wife got off completely without any jail time. Sergio, Bruno's cousin, was a key witness in the case. Because he was 17 years old, the judge found him not guilty, but in 2012, he was killed. He was hit by a motorcycle that had followed him from his home on his way to work. The police lost a key witness in the case. In 2013, Bruno was sentenced to 22 years in prison, but in 2017, after another appeal, the man was released. Four days after his release, he joined a new soccer club called BOA from Varginha. On April 8, 2017, he played for the new soccer team. By accepting Bruno as a member of the team, the club lost all its sponsors. On April 25th, his appeal was rejected and he was ordered to serve a full prison sentence, but Bruno and his lawyers insisted that there wasn't enough evidence to prove that he had done anything to Elisa Samudio. 
However, the new judge said that traces of the victim's blood in his car were enough for him to continue serving his sentence, and that if Bruno wanted to reduce his sentence, he would have to reveal where the remains of her body were. The footballer continued to maintain his innocence. 1947. In 2019, Bruno's lawyer secured a semi-open prison regime for him. He could be free during the day and return to prison at night. He joined a new football club called Posis de Caldas, but after a few games his contract was terminated because he could not actively participate in all the training sessions due to the semi-open prison regime. To this day, Bruno is still in a semi-open regime and is looking for a new club that will accept him. To this day, it is not known where the remains of Elisa's body are. Sergio, the only witness who gave information to the police, died under very strange circumstances and Bruno continues to maintain that he is innocent. He divorced his wife and remarried. The ceremony took place in a semi-open prison. Bruno lives an almost normal life, has a wife, spends a lot of time outside the prison and is able to work. Meanwhile, the victim's mother, Fatima, is searching for her daughter's remains and raising her grandson.